The Bible tells us that we have not because we ask not. So we ask today that our joy and your joy may be full. Support Worship Center Radio by going to www.worshipcenterradio.net and on the right side, click the Donate Now area. Send your love offering that we may continue to broadcast throughout the world and to bring you programming that elevates you to the next level in God. We have put the great commission given to us by our Lord Jesus in action. We thank you in advance for your financial support. From Detroit to the nations, you are listening to the world's number one Christian station, Worship Center Radio, the platform of champions. I'm Cindy Davis, and this is Daily Living. God, praise God. Delighted to be able to come to you today in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. For as always, this is a day that the Lord has made and the Bible declares that we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Do you know if you think about it, even on our roughest days, there are people that would change places with us. And there are untold thousands of people in the graves that would love to have one more day on earth. One more day to tell somebody that they love them, to look at the sun, the skies, the moon, and the stars, to complete a project, to breathe air. So much uh, unfinished business when you're at the end of your life and you're laying on your bed of affliction or your deathbed. So many things go through your head of what I could have done, what I should have done. By me working in a field, being around many people in their last days, So much unfinished business and so many things that people would go back and do differently. So let's make the most out of this day. Let's not put those things off that we need to deal with today. Let's not uh, keep words in that we need to put out. Let's uh, seek forgiveness and ask for forgiveness. And so that is my plea and my cry for the radio listeners on today. So before we go any further, we'll go to the throne of grace and seek the most high God, our Father, for his blessings upon this broadcast. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, your son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We pray According to your word, Lord, we pray in the name of the sacrificial lamb, the one who sacrificed and shed his blood for all mankind. We come boldly before the throne of grace because as we have a relationship with you, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. It is a benefit to having a relationship with you. It is a benefit to walking with you, Lord. So we come today in humility, Lord. We come today exalting you and being in a a base place myself, Lord, that you would increase and I might decrease, that the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O God, that whatever is said would be pleasing to you, Lord, that your anointing would flow upon the words, your word, your written word, your holy word, for the anointing destroys the yoke. Your Bible truly says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So, Lord, we thank you for the ability to attain and retain knowledge. But that knowledge without the anointing profits little for the kingdom, Lord. Your word says in all you're getting, get an understanding. We thank you for an understanding, Lord. But we desire your anointing, for the anointing destroys the yoke. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. So I thank you, Lord. And I praise you. 
And I bless your holy name. I ask that you prepare the hearts and the minds of the listeners, that they would receive what you have for each individual to receive, that that mysteries would unfold and, and things of the past would be made clearer, Lord. And things that weren't connected would be connected, Lord. And insight would come and, and lights would go on in the minds of the listeners, Lord. Hallelujah. You desire for your people to be free, Lord. You desire for us to be free, Father. And so many times the enemy has held us in bondage by our past or by a lack of understanding of the word or wrong teachings. So, Lord, I pray freedom for your people on today. For he who the Son set free is free indeed. I pray freedom on the minds of your people. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen. So last week, we were talking about the difference between uh, different types of uh, sin. Uh, we talked about a interpretation of a scripture that sometimes uh, people interpret it to not in a way that God meant it to be interpreted. And so we, we uh, were studying from Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, where God was making it very plain of a scripture that had been used uh, in the old, by, by the old saints, the, the old people of God. And we're going to read that again, Ezekiel 18 and verse number 2. God said, why do people use this proverb about the land of Israel? That the children are punished for their father's sins. And then God says, as I live, you will not use this proverb anymore in Israel. For all souls are minds to judge, father and sons alike. And my rule is this. It is for a man's own sins that he will die. <clears throat> so, what, what God is saying, the children won't be punished for their father's sins, but the father's sins will affect their children. And the enemy, if he can get in there in any way and misconstrue or distort something in Scripture, that's what he will do. If he can make you think, well, because my father did this or that, I'm doomed then why would you even try? Why would you even seek God? Why would you even strive for a better life or to get to know God if you think it's already decided? So the children aren't necessarily punished for their father's sins unless they decide to, in their heart, continue on in that way that their father has decided to go, their fathers, if they are living a life of evilness or wickedness. So, we gave a couple of examples. It talked about from the fall of man that even though Adam and Eve were grateful for God and knew God, their relationship changed when they sinned and when they disobeyed God. But then in Genesis 4.26, it says that people begin again to call upon the name of the Lord. So because of sin, because of disobedience, the relationship was changed. Yes, God was still there. God was still God. But because of disobedience and sin, the relationship was changed. We can get out of fellowship. We don't have to stay out of fellowship, but we can come out of fellowship. It's not God that moved. It's not God that changed. Sometimes we do things or we make decisions or choices <clears throat> that change our relationship with God. It doesn't have to be a permanent change. God is ready and willing and waiting for us to get back on track. And then we read um, about Enoch, where it said he walked with God in the midst of what everyone else was doing. In the midst of sin and debauchery and lack of fellowship, 
He made a choice. There was something in him that was drawing close to God and wanting God and loving God. So if you go back where it says the children are punished for their father's sins and God says, no, don't even use this proverb anymore. Anyone that cries out to God, that wants something different, that wants a relationship, that wants to be holy, that even seeks to know more, that person is not under the judgment of their father. They're not under the judgment of being punished for their father's sins. So in 18, Ezekiel 18 and 5, the verse says, but if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, and then it goes into a list of different things, And then it says, if he obeys my laws, that man is just and he shall surely live. He said, but if this particular man or man has a son who is a robber or a murderer and who fulfills none of his responsibilities, and then it goes into the list of laws that he may refuse to obey and different things he may do, such as adultery, oppressing the poor and the helpless, robs people, different things, it said, That man, will he live? No, he shall surely die. And it is his own fault. It's not his father's fault. Maybe he took up some habits of his father or some habits of his uh, life. But it says it is his own fault. But then it goes on to say in verse 14, but if this sinful man has in turn a son who sees all his father's wickedness, And he decides that he fears God and he does not want that kind of life. And he does not do all those wicked, evil things that his father did. He shall surely live. But his father shall die for his own sins because he was the cruel one and he was robber and did wrong. So verse 19 says, what? You, doesn't the son pay for his father's sins? The scripture says, no. For if the son does what is right and keeps God's laws, he shall surely live. The one who sins is the one who dies. The son shall not be punished for his father's sins, nor the father for his sons. The righteous person will be rewarded for his own goodness and the wicked person for his wickedness. So what what, what God is, is, is saying that, yes, our life may affect us growing up in a home where alcohol is prevalent. Growing up in a home where uh, drug abuse is prevalent. Growing up in a home where there's a lot of sexual immorality. Growing up in a home where there's a crime or violence. Yes, these things affect us. But the Bible tells us uh, that we all have an innate knowing of God. We may override it. We may um, ignore it. We may uh, decide that we want to do something a different way. But we are told that the invisible things of the world prove that there is a God. And so we're going to read in Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 12 through 15. He, God, will punish sin wherever it is found. He will punish the heathen when they sin, even though they never had God's written law. For down in their hearts, they know right from wrong. God's laws are written within them. Man's own consciousness accuses them or sometimes excuses them. It says even more so, and then it goes into those that know the law are even under a heavy, heavier mandate of punishment when they sin because they know the law but this is saying but the ones who didn't who never had God's written word they knew in their hearts that was from the living bible translation we're going to read from the king james translation the same set of uh scriptures acts i mean romans 2 starting at verse 12 For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For the haters of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. 
But the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. The Bible says the invisible things of the world prove that there is a God. And we can't use the excuse of, I, I didn't have the Bible, I didn't have the Word, because it, it just told us um, that the laws are written down in the hearts of man. The Bible says we're drawn away by our own lust. God gives us a free will. We have a choice. When that little thing, which is the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God, is telling us yes, no, yay, nay, go this way, go that way, and we decide in our own thinking, the scripture says there's a way that seems right unto man. We decide to do something else. We're going to read uh, 2 Thessalonians verse 2 and 10. It says, God will completely fool those who are on their way to hell because they have said no to the truth. They have refused to believe it and love it and let it save them. So God will allow them to believe the lies with all their heart. And all of them will be justly judged for believing falsehood, refusing the truth, and enjoying their sins. So we know instinctively. A lot of times as we override the Holy Spirit, the, the voice of the Holy Spirit will get weaker. But that's because we have chosen to override it, not because it's not there and, and not because it's not true. So when, when the scripture is saying a man is not punished for his father's sins, you're not punished for your father's sins, but they do affect you. We're not saying that they don't affect you. And so by us having a free will, we all have a choice. We all have a choice about which way to go. Do we want to fo follow in our father and mothers or family members? It's not always the father and mother, but sometimes it's the family members' footsteps. Let's go to Romans 1 and 20 and finish the little piece we were just talking about before we go any further. We're going to read from the King James Version first, and then we're going to read from the Living Bible. Romans 1 and 20 says, For the invisible things of him. Okay, let's go up one verse to verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, the gospel needs to be preached to every creature. But what God is saying is that no one can say, I, I didn't know, I didn't realize, I didn't know God. Because he's saying from something innate in us from creation. So we're going to read from the Living, Living Bible now. For the truth about God is known to them meaning man, instinctively. God has put his knowledge in their hearts. Let's start at verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful evil men who push away the truth from them. So it's saying push away the truth. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put his knowledge in their hearts. Since earliest times, men have seen the earth and sky and all God made and have known of his existence and great eternal power so that they will have no excuse when they stand before God at Judgment Day. Yes, they knew about him all right, but they wouldn't admit it or worship him or even thank him for all 
his daily care. And after a while, they began to think of silly ideals of what God was like and what he wanted them to do. The result was that their foolish minds became dark and confused. Claiming themselves to be wise without God, they became utter fools instead. And then instead of worshiping and glorify, glor, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they took wood and stone and made idols for themselves, carving them to look like mere birds and animals and snakes and puny men. So the, if, if you're raised even in a household of heathens or evil or wickedness, debauchery, the Lord is saying there's something in us. There's something there that we can draw on, that we can listen to, that we can obey, that we can lean towards. You know, the scriptures talk about having a bent towards certain things. So because your family is a mess or heathens or full of, full of stuff doesn't mean you have to be. So that, that's what that scripture is telling us. It's for a man's own sins that he should die. Not that your life won't affect you, but it doesn't give you a death sentence. It doesn't give you, a, well, it's nothing you can do about it, which is what many people had taught or inferred, even if they didn't teach it, it was inferred. I remember when I was a child, uh, having no knowledge of God that I knew about, um, having not been taught about God by anybody, my mother had made a decision that she would let her children decide whom and who and how they wanted to worship when they became adults, that she would not impose a belief on them as children. And so growing up not knowing of God, not knowing the Ten Commandments even, maybe hearing something here and there, but not having a capacity to connect it or formulate something in my young mind, I had no point of reference for God. And in my family, there was a different branch of my family. And I think my mother kind of looked down on them because they, they had some mental illness in their family. And they kind of were like a little wild and on the party inside. And my mother was a teetotaler and they um, didn't drink, didn't party. So she looked down on them a little bit, some of them. Well, one day when she went to work, she had one of these particular cousins come and babysit myself and my brother and sister. And uh, they lived very close, and it was convenient. And uh, this was one that I guess she didn't feel too bad about. So at the end of the day, this cousin said, well, let's go say our prayers. And I'm like, what's that? And I had to be 9 or 10, somewhere around 9 or 10. Never had heard of saying your prayers. And I'm, I'm questioning her as to what's that. And she's looking at me like, how could you not know about prayers? Okay, so this is the same family that my mother looked down on because of their lifestyle. But this is how I got introduced to the concept of God and prayer. So she told us to get on our knees. And she <clears throat> began to tell us how to talk to God and how to pray. To me, in my state of being a heathen, I was just laughing. I'm looking at this lady. And she's talking to somebody that's not there. And she's serious and she wants me to do it. And I just couldn't stop laughing. And she was so hurt. She was grieved that I didn't want to talk to God. And that she couldn't teach me about this God. I was just laughing. I don't remember my brother and sister's reaction. I don't know if we were all together. I know at least my sister and I were together because we slept in the same room. I don't know if she prayed with my brother separately or if, if he was in the room with us, but I remember my reaction. And I remember how grieved she was. And so she just told me to go on to bed. And that night, <laughs> God showed me he was real. <laughs> Even though I was a little child, she left that room and turned the light off. And in a few minutes, I felt something in the room. <laughs> Being a child, I didn't know what it was, but I didn't like it. And I felt a pressure coming down from the ceiling. 
And I didn't know what it was, but it was like a pressure. Like, say, if the ceiling is just coming down on you and the room is getting smaller. But what ended up happening was this big hand ended up just placing itself on my back. It covered my whole body, if I remember correctly. So the pressure was this hand coming down. It terrified me so much that I held my breath. I thought, if I hold my breath, it'll go. It won't know I'm alive. It'll leave. Not even connecting at that point until a little bit, a few days later, that that must have been that God that she was talking about. So even though I had been raised in a household without God, didn't know God, never taught about God, God sent somebody there and I was introduced to God. But even if that doesn't happen, he talked about the invisible things of creation show that there's a God. It says he has put his knowledge in mankind's heart. He says since earliest of times before the Bible was even written that men have seen the earth and sky and all that God has made and have knowledge of the existence and great eternal power of God. So we can't use our mother and father's sin as an excuse or a crutch for not formulating a relationship with God, just as we can't also use our parents' relationship with God to try to establish or formulate us having a relationship with God. Many people, because their mother, father, grandparents, somebody is a powerful anointed minister, powerful anointed teacher or preacher, or well-known, well, my mother is so-and-so, or my father is so-and-so, or my family has done this, or we've been in this church for this number of years. That doesn't establish your relationship with God. Just as sin is not an automatic disconnect of you from God, your family's relationship with God does not establish your relationship with God. So what God wants us to understand in this passage is it's up to us. It is up to every person on their own to decide if they want a relationship with God. Unfortunately, every man, woman, and child is born into sin by default. The scripture tells us by one man, sin entered the world. We're all descendants of that one man. We all carry his bloodline when we are born. Even the innocent child has his bloodline of evilness, and wickedness and separation from God. It's not because you're bad. It's not your fault. So don't get all bent out of shape and upset about that. But it's in your power to change that. The Bible tells us that there are two opposing kingdoms. And I'm going to read a little segment of scripture to help you understand these two opposing kingdoms. We're going to read in Colossians. This, uh, These scriptures are speaking to those who are born again, who have received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But it gives a very good example of the two opposing kingdoms. This scripture says that the apostles were praying that these Christians would be filled with God's mighty glorious strength so that they could keep going on no matter what happens. It says that they could be always full of the joy of the Lord and always thankful to the Father who has made the Christians, the believers, fit to share all the wonderful things that belong to those who live in the kingdom of light. So it told us there are certain things made available for us to share and they're wonderful things, but they belong to those who live in the kingdom of light. So it says, God has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom. That's the kingdom we're all born into. By default, it's nothing you can do about it except become born again. And he's rescued us out of that darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. Rescued us out of the gloom and darkness of Satan's kingdom and bought us into the kingdom of his dear son because his son bought our freedom with his blood and forgave us all our sins. So we have a choice as human beings. God gave us a free will. 
You're in that system by default. You don't have to remain in that system. No matter what your background has been in your family, your experience in life, no matter what the enemy has thrown at you, because John 10.10 10 tells us that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, it doesn't matter. There's opportunity for anyone and everyone to come out of darkness and come into the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God's son. The Bible tells us that all our goodness is as filthy rags. And many times we compare ourselves with others or we look at ourselves in relation to others and we put ourselves on some level of I'm not that bad or I've not done this or at least this or at least that. It doesn't matter if you've never done anything. If you sat on a pillow and never done anything wrong in your life. You're still a sinner. If you never lied, cheated, stole, fornicated, was an adultery, drank, lasciviousness, drunk, or whatever, you're still a sinner. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Psalms 51 and 5 says, I was born a sinner. The scripture tells us in Romans 3, 10, and 20, 3, 10, and also the verse 23, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so, first of all, we have to come to terms with us being sinners, us being separated from God because of sin. It's inherited sin, and as we grow and experience life, it's personal sin. We have inherited sin, and then we have our own personal sin. So, um, Romans 5 and 12 is the scripture we were talking about earlier, that by one man sin entered into the world. That's the, uh, by default, that we are born into sin, that it, it, it's nothing we've done personally at that time of our birth, and it's nothing we can do about it. Um, and so let me see, um, let's go to verse 15. Mm, okay. That's not scripture I'm looking for. So we'll go to Romans five and 12 for now until I, uh, find that scripture that I'm looking for. Romans 5, starting at verse uh, 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. His sin spread death throughout all the world. So everything began to grow old and die for all sin. We know that it was Adam's sin that caused this because although, of course, people were sinning from the time of Adam until Moses, God did not in those days judge them guilty of death for breaking his laws because he had not yet given his laws to them, nor told them what he wanted them to do. So when their bodies died, it was not for their own sins, since they themselves had never disobeyed God's special laws against eating the forbidden fruit as Adam had. For this one man, Adam, skipping down to verse 15, brought death to many through his sin. But this one man, Christ Jesus, brought forgiveness to many through God's mercy. Adam's one sin brought the penalty of death to many, while Christ freely takes away many sins and gives glorious life instead. The sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to be king over all. But all who will take God's gift of forgiveness and acquittal are kings of life because of this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's sin brought punishment to all, but Christ's righteousness makes men right with God so that they can live. Adam caused many to be sinners because he disobeyed God. And Christ caused many to be made acceptable to God because he obeyed God. Hallelujah. So you don't have to remain in a life of sin. 
So we're establishing that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We established, uh, as we read Ecclesiastes 7.20, that there is not a just man upon earth who does good and sinneth not. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So in Isaiah 59 and 2, it says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have caused him to hide his face from you, and he will not hear. So we're establishing the sin root. The Bible tells us, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Isaiah 59 and 2. So if we stay in that state of inherited sin and do nothing about it, the wages of sin is death. Everyone deserves hell because of our bloodline. When you're an infant, you have not done anything wrong, but you have inherited sin. So God came up with a plan. He made a way for his creation not to be doomed to hell because of one man's sin. The Bible tells us that God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is Romans 5 and 8. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by him, Jesus Christ, John 14 and 6. So we, we talked about the kingdom of darkness and light in Colossians. We talked about being born into sin. Now we're talking about the remedy of coming out. We just talked about um, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man coming to the Father except by him. So first... We must genuinely be sorry for the life we have lived. Even if we didn't know, even if it was out of ignorance, we must be repentant. And repentant does mean turning away and being sorry. But we're going to read in James about um, James 4 and 9 about the type of repentance that is actually called for. The scripture says, let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and sincere grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Then when you realize your worthlessness before the Lord, he will lift you up and encourage and help you. So repentance is necessary. Understanding that we're all born into sin and we're sinners. And then we must repent. Luke 13 and 3 says, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. True repentance produces a new way of living. Psalms 119 and 59 states, I thought on my ways and I turned my feet unto God's testimonies. So repentance and then Next, we must believe. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that if we shall confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shall believe in our hearts that God hath raised him, meaning Jesus Christ, from the dead, we shall be saved. For with man's heart does he believe unto salvation and righteousness. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You will find uh, that scripture in Romans 10, 9, and 10. So first, we had repentance. Then we have believing and confessing. Then we ask God. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is what we do. We call on the name of the Lord to save us. For eternal life, life eternal. You can find that in Romans 10 and 13. So many people will say, I believe in God. But we're going to show you that uh, believing in God is is not enough. It's one of the steps (laughs) that's necessary, but it's, it's not enough for salvation. James 2 verse 19 says, Are there still some among you who hold that only believing is enough? Believing in one God. Then it says, well, remember 
that the demons believe this too. They believe it so strongly that they tremble in terror. And then it calls these types of people fools. When will you ever learn that believing is useless without doing what God wants you to do? Faith that does not result in good deeds is not real faith. And what that is saying there, that if you believe, then do what's necessary to support your belief. You can't just, if, if, if the devils believe, and they believe it so strongly that they tremble, they believe in one God, but we know no devil or demon will ever have a relationship with the Father. They will never have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They will never partake of fellowship and communion with the Father. They will not go to heaven. So this is showing us that belief without the works that need to score, correspond is not going to get you anywhere. It is a necessary step, but it is a step. You can't just believe and leave it at that. And so we're thankful that God has given us the opportunity that we're not bound by our family's past. We're not bound by what we were raised in. We're not bound by uh, even satanic rituals, things that our, our parents may have done, uh, demon worshipers, devil worshipers, star worshipers, moon worshipers, whoever they are, whatever they are, God has made a way. God has made a way for us to be saved and come into a relationship with him. He says he wants all men to be saved and come into the glorious saving knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for making a way. Thank you for listening to Daily Living. Join us every Thursday from 10 to 11 a.m. where we discuss everyday living according to the scriptures of God. Go to www.worshipcenterradio.net and click on the Daily Living tab for more information. Once again, thanks for listening and see you next week.